In the previous lecture, we saw how to measure how good of a job a model is doing on a set of data, but we only looked at the same set of data that it was trained on. There's a problem with that. We might be getting deceptively good performance and a low error or a low misclassification rate only because the model is overfitting the, to the data. It's, it's fitting the noise and not just the trend. Um, and so we need a way of finding out how well would this model do on data that it hasn't been trained on? How well is that performance going to generalize? And we can think of this uh, along two lines. Uh, first, what would the error or the misclassification rate be on new data that the model has not been trained on? This is usually referred to as the issue of testing. And the second question, which is actually the one that we're gonna focus on more today is, what hyperparameter values, such as for a support vector machine, you remember you can tune the model by choosing the cost, you can tune k nearest neighbors by picking k. Uh, what hyperparameter values are going to strike a balance between underfitting and overfitting? And equivalently, how can you manage the bias variance trade-off? And if you're trying to answer that second question, that's usually commonly referred to as validation. And for the most part, we're going to focus on the validation approach in lecture 19. Well, the answers to both of these are guided by the, the same principle, which is important enough for us to write down. Never evaluate or test a model on the same data it is trained on. Never evaluate a model on the same data it's trained on. If you use model or if you use data to build a model and then you test it on that same data, if it's overfitting, you really have no way of knowing that. Instead, we'd always like to evaluate a model on different data than it has been trained on. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna take our data split up into subsets. Subset used for training the model is the training set. Uh, and then the rest of the data could be used for a couple of different purposes and we give it different names depending on that. If with the remaining subset is used for estimating the model's error in a production setting, then it's usually called the test set. If the remaining subset is used for choosing a hyperparameter value, like the cost parameter in a support vector machine, then it'll be called the validation set. And sometimes the test set and validation set are combined into the overall concept of a holdout set. So whatever is uh, being saved away from training, you would call a holdout set. And then just some similar terminology. If you're reading uh, machine learning literature and you hear somebody talking about uh, an out of bag set, that's very similar. And it come, the name comes from this. Do you remember random forests? And they were built by bootstrap aggregating or called bagging of models. Well, if you think of the bag as the bootstrap data that it's trained on, then any data from the sample that it's not being trained on uh, out of the bootstrap sample is out of bag. And in that context, you could use it to estimate the error of the bagged model. So just slightly different. If you see out of bag, you can think of that as something very similar to a holdout set. For the example in this lecture, we're going to look at using a support vector machine to predict heart disease which you've been doing, uh, predicting whether somebody has heart disease this whole unit uh, in the homework problems. Now we're actually gonna try to find out how, how accurate are those, are those models, in particular the SVM. All right, so let's start with uh, the simplest way of doing this, the straightforward validation approach. We're going to take the data set and imagine this uh, long rectangle representing the data. We're gonna split it up into a training set. The model gets to see this data. That's what it's actually used to build the model. And then the rest of it will be the validation set. So the model's trained on this part and the model's evaluated on this. A 
Okay, so before we do this, uh, two points to make. One, before we actually split up the data, it's a good idea to put it in a random order, to randomly shuffle the, the rows of the data set. And the reason is if the data is collected, say sequentially in time, and you have a little bit of dependence or correlation in uh, rows that are adjacent, you wanna break that. And so just randomly shuffling everything should break that correlation. You don't want all the stuff in your training set to be similar to each other, but somehow different from stuff in the validation set. All right, so we'll randomly order or shuffle the data first. And then the second uh, point is, how should we apportion this? What's a reasonable split between training and validation? I've seen a lot of stuff. Uh, I've seen it go 50-50. Uh, a lot of times something like 75, 25, 80 to 20, those are probably the two that I see most often. I've even seen a really lopsided 90, 10. Um, for the example we're about to do, we'll pick 80, 20, but there's no universal answer to uh, what's best for this. It's somewhat arbitrary. All right, so let's use an 80, 20 split. And in particular, uh, we know that there's different kernels for a support vector machine. Kind of the most basic one is linear. Something a little more advanced is a radial one. And there's a few others, but we'll just focus on these two. I wanna know which one of these should I use? Am I going to get a more accurate classification out of a linear SVM or a radial SVM? Okay, so uh, let's take a look at the code here on paper first, and then I'll run it in R in a moment. I'll import my data set. And you might remember in the homework, an SVM, it will remove any rows that have a missing value anywhere. And even though these variables of interest don't have any missing values, some of the other variables in the data set do. So I'm restricting attention and just selecting out these variables before I pass it into SVM so that it's not removing anything uh, with a missing, missing entry. I'll make my response a factor. And all right, so now I'm starting to get into the concepts from today. First thing I'll do is I'll use sample one to however many rows I have for heart. And if I sample from that, it's really just gonna give me a random ordering of the numbers from one to how many rows are in this? It's 500 something, right? And then I'm going to pick, uh, I'm gonna use those as indices on the rows and then I'll pick every column. So that's just going to shuffle things and that's probably worth seeing right now. All right, so I'll come here. And notice when I import it, it gives me row names, which are just indices for the rows. One, two, well, it stops printing at 200, but it's actually, all right, it's 303 observations. It's not as many as I thought it was. So yeah, let's look and see what this will do. That call to sample is just gonna give me the numbers one to 303 in a random order. I'll use those as row indices. And so then this heart shuffled the same data set. I just see my row numbers are shuffled around. It's in a different order. All right, I wanna use 80% of this for training and then 20% for validation. So uh, train proportion, I'll set as 0.8. And then if you try to take 80% of 303, that's not gonna come out as a perfect integer. 242.4. So I'll round that to get 242. And so then my train indices are going to be the first 242 rows of the data set. And because it's randomly ordered, that's effectively picking a random 242 rows. All right. So I'll set up train indices as 1 to 242. I'll pull those out of heart shuffled to build the training set. Oops. And then remember how the negative indices will remove those. So then if I remove what's in the training set, what's left over must be in the validation set. That's how I define heart validate. Right, so just take a look up in the environment. 242 of those are now assigned to training and then 61 are reserved, are held out for validation. Okay, and then after this, it's pretty easy. It's stuff we've done before. Since I have two fits, I'll give a uh, post name to this, a postscript fit linear for a linear kernel and fit radial for a radial kernel. So I'll run both of those, or at least I try to and it can't find the function because I didn't load the package that support vector machines are in. 
try again. Okay. And notice something. When I fit these, I'm not passing in heart. I'm just passing in heart train. It's only seeing those first 242 rows of this. Then I make my predictions and look at what I pass in for the new data. I'm passing in the complement of the training set, everything that it hasn't been trained on. So let's get all the predictions from the linear kernel on the validation set, all the predictions from the radio kernel. And then here, I think I, uh, there was a mistake when I uploaded the notes. The one you printed, does it say length of train indices right here? No, it says in row heart validate. Okay, I did, I did fix it before I uploaded the folio. All right, never mind then. I made a mistake before, but that's irrelevant now. All right, so I've got my predictions from each of these. I'm going to look and see what the real classifications are in the validation set. Look and see what they're predicted to be from the two models. I'll add up the number of misclassifications. I'll divide by how many things there are to look at in the validation set. All right, and so it looks like my error rate from the linear kernel SVM is around 26. Error rate from the radial kernel is higher than that, 29.5. This is lower, which is better. And the higher error rate, higher misclassification, that's higher, that's worse. So it looks like this model is actually overfitting a little bit. The radial kernels are more flexible. And in case this case, that looks like it was a bad thing. Okay. Um, let me pause for questions there. Any questions on this first example of training and validation? I'd say probably the most important thing as you go through, just look and make sure that when things are fit, you realize training data is being used. When predictions are made, that's on a different set of data that the model has not seen yet. Okay, two drawbacks of this simple kind of validation. Uh, remember how we randomly shuffled the data at the beginning? We randomly shuffled that again, we'd have a different set of data in the, the training set, different set of data in the validation set. So if I run this code, I'm not gonna get back the same thing, right? Let's experiment a little bit. Let me, I'll just highlight all of this up to where the data is shuffled. Let's run it again. Ooh, now this time, both of the error rates are a little bit higher, 34 and 32. This time we actually reach a different conclusion. This time the linear, kernel SVM has a little bit higher error rate. Is that gonna happen often though? Okay, again, we see linear is better, linear is better. Most of the time when I run this and tested it, most of the time it looks like the linear kernel is doing uh, a good bit better, but there's variation and that's not guaranteed. So uh, we can get highly variable estimates of the error rate and that might even change our final decision about which one of these two models we think is best. All right, the second drawback is obviously models perform better in general when they have more data. But if we're holding back part of the data and the training set is smaller, that's going to make the model a little bit worse, right? Uh, so we'd like to be able to train the data on all of the data, but then we wouldn't have anything left for validation. So is there some way to use all the data for training that doesn't violate the principle of not evaluating on the same data that you're trained on? Well, I'm glad you asked. There is. It's called cross-validation. Uh, cross-validation is basically doing what we just did over and over again, but using a different set of data for the validation set each time. Uh, we're going to break up the data into subsets that are usually called folds. The number of folds is traditionally represented by K. We're already using K for K nearest neighbors and capital K for the number of levels. So I'm just going to give it a uh, a variable kind of name. I'll just call it num folds. So let's suppose that I wanted to do a five fold validation, cross validation. Let me imagine having my data set arrayed out before me five times.
Okay, and I'm going to go through and I'm going to uh, split this up into five parts. So zero is the beginning of the data set. Let's break it up into one fifths, two fifths, three fifths, four fifths, and five fifths or one. Also over here on the left, let me put a header for which fold we're talking about. So I've got fold one, two, three, four, and five. Well, in the first one, I'm going to take this first 20% of the data set. I'll hold that out for validation. And then the rest of this is going to be for training. And when I go to my second fold, I'm going to use the second 20% for validation. And then the rest is going to be for training. I don't want to write training that many times over and over again. So I'll just leave that blank. And then in the third fold, it's going to be the third portion that's used for validation. And then the fourth, and then the fifth. And in each one of these, whatever doesn't have validation written there, it's going to be used as the training set. All right, so I'll train on the last 80%, test it out on the first. Train on everything except the second 20%, uh, test on that, and go on. And then at the end, I'll look at the total number of misclassification errors, or if it's regression, I'll look at the total sum of squared error over all the validations, combine those together. And so this lets me train the model on all of the data, at least at some point, kind of taking turns, and also get the tested on everything. All right, this makes sense. Okay. Uh, here's a function I wrote that will help with the cross validation. Um, let's take a look and see how this works. So we'll go to the code and let me set up a couple of variables using the console. This function accepts data and numfolds. Let's set data to just be the heart data set. And let me set numfolds equal to five. All right, so let me run the inside of this. First calculates capital N, which is just gonna be however many rows there are. And then, well, we've seen this just from a moment ago, that's shuffling the data around. So now data is in a, a random order, as I can tell by the row numbers. Then it creates a vector called folds. It uses a built-in function called cut. We won't get too deep into that. Let's just look at the result of this. There are 303 rows in the data set. This makes an integer vector of length 303. And notice the first 20% get a one, the second 20% get a two, then three, then four, and five. So I, I could loop over this and say, well, wherever there's a one, let that be the validation, everything else is trained. I could come back again and say, wherever there's a two, those are the rows where I want to be for validation, everything else is for training and so on and so on. I think uh, the apply functions are a little more elegant than for loops. So I'm using L apply, but this is doing basically what I just said. It makes a little empty list. It looks to see wherever the folds, this integer vector is not equal to X. And then it assigns that to training wherever it is equal to X, it assigns that to validation, and X just goes from one up to five. So let me run that. Now the output's pretty long because it just took my data set and transformed it uh, five different ways. Let's just look at, let's just look at the last one. All right, so when we get to the fifth fold, it's split up into a large portion, which is training, you can see from how long it takes me to scroll. That's pretty big. That's 80% of the data set. And then also has a component or an entry named validate. And then that's the last 20% that it'll use for validation. All right, that makes sense. Any questions on that? This very last part of the class, in particular, this lecture and then 20, there's not as many 
good general functions that are going to work for all the different statistical learning methods. So I'm having to write more stuff that'll work for the kind of code that we've been using before in the class so that it'll all integrate together. And this is part of that. Okay, uh, I think I'm ready to go to an example. Basically the same example. We're still comparing a linear kernel SVM to a radial kernel SVM. It's just now instead of using ordinary val validation, I'm gonna use tenfold cross validation. All right, so setting up, setting up the data, we've already looked at that part. We just looked at how CV list works. And this is probably kind of hard to read your first time. Let me try to break this down. I see S apply, so I can think of that like a for loop. It's going to iterate over the things in CV list, which are those folds, breaking up the data into training and testing. It's a function of X. So I build my fit object using the SVM, same formula as before, but now the data, it's going to look at that particular fold out of CV list, that's the X. It's gonna pull out just the training part and fit it using a linear kernel. So that's probably the most important line right here. It'll get predictions by using that fit object. And then what it's gonna make predictions on is the same fold, but now the validate part instead of the training part. And I wanted to make sure I get back the class predictions out of that. And then we've seen this kind of line that's looking at the number of uh, misclassifications. Let me run just that part of the code and see what the output is. So from here down to here. Okay, it doesn't work if I don't run that line first. Okay, so the way I would read this is it did 10 folds. On the validation set in the first fold, there were nine classification errors. On the validation set in the second fold, there were eight classification errors, and so on and so on. Now, I know that every row in the data set is represented in one and exactly one of these folds. So if I sum these, then I'm getting the overall number of misclassifications over the entire data set. So I just take that vector, I pipe it, Type it into sum. So there's 96 misclassifications overall. And then I'll just divide that by the number of rows of heart so I can turn this into a misclassification rate. About 32%. This linear kernel misclassified about 32% of them. All right, so think on that one until you understand it. Once you do, fortunately, the next one, all I have to do is change the kernel to radial. The rest of the code is the same, fortunately. So let's check that out. And let's see, 30, about 32% for linear, just a little bit higher for the radial. So like before, we're still seeing, it looks like the linear kernel has a, a little better classification rate. All right, and when I ran this for, yeah, when I compiled my markdown document and it ran, Again, it looks like linear is a bit better. All right, I'll pause again. Now that you've seen your first cross-validation example, do you have any questions on that? I think a good question is, uh, why did I use 10 folds? Why not five or 15 or, or 37? It's kind of funny, every time we introduce a technique to answer a question, it's just gonna raise another question, right? Well, here's some guidance on picking the number of folds. First, I'll mention the extreme case. The extreme case is leave one out cross-validation. Do you remember that from uh, regression in the spring or the press statistic? Those are the same thing. Uh, what if the number of folds is in? What if it's the sample size? So this is the extreme case where you take the data set, you just pick one observation, and you say, all right, you're the validation set right now, and the rest of it is for training. And then you pick the second observation, 
which is still only one observation in that set, and you say you're for validation, the rest is for training. Uh, you can do this, right? This is equivalent to you loop over the observations, remove one from the training set, fit the data on everything else, and then just use that whole model just to make one prediction and see how that compares to the one that was held out. One thing that I like about leave one out cross validation, can you see how this is going to remove any randomness from the assignment of data into the folds? It does. So as an instructor, I actually like this because I can run my code, I'll get an answer. You run your code, you'll get the same answer. Um, all the randomness from assignment to folds has been removed. Okay, but that still doesn't answer the question yet. How many folds should we pick? Here are the pros and cons. If you have a large number of folds with leave one out cross validation being the extreme case of this, well, like I just said, the good thing is randomness of the output of cross validation is reduced and we can all get the same answer. And that's nice for educational purposes. Second thing is nearly all of the training data is used when you build the model for each fold. So the estimate of the error rate is approximately unbiased. As you leave data out, you're introducing a little more of a bias and then that bias goes away as you use more and more of the data in the, uh, in the training set, which you can see here. Imagine there's 100 observations. If you put 99% of the training set, that's almost all of it. Uh, and your estimate of the error rate is then approximately unbiased. All right, well, what's the bad thing about that? There's almost always a trade-off between bias and variance, right? So if I get low bias from a high number of folds, I'm gonna get high variance from a large number of folds. And here's why. The larger num folds is, the more overlap there is between training sets for the folds. Let me come back here and think about these two folds. Uh, they share, actually be 60%. Sixty percent of the training set is in common. So those models, they're not independent of each other. They share a lot of the same data. And so the error on the validation set between those two models, they're not independent, but they're highly correlated. And I think we have seen earlier in the class, uh, if you average uncorrelated things, your variance will go down, but that effect is weakened when you average correlated things together, dependent things. Yeah, so building many models with highly correlated data, that's going to increase the variance of the error best estimate. And the second thing is computational burden. If you have a certain number of folds, you have to fit that many models. And if your data set is large, and it's going to take a long time to fit a model anyway, uh, and you pick a large number of folds, and you have to repeat that that many times, and what if you're doing a neural network, something that's already kind of slow to train? you might get to a point where it's unreasonable to have a large number of folds in cross-validation. So what's a good number to use in practice? Consensus is that between five and 10. That's usually a reasonable trade-off between bias, variance, and computational burden. And then you can tailor this to the size of your data a little bit. If you have a very large uh, sample, you probably don't need as many folds. And maybe you can go down five, four, three, two. If you have a small sample size, uh, then you would probably raise the number of folds and maybe you'd even get as extreme as leave one out cross validation. All right, questions on that. I think we're getting, this is our last example, right? Today's a little shorter. Uh, the code's a little more complicated and the, I guess the concepts aren't too bad, uh, but it won't take us as long to get through this, this lecture. For my last one, I want to increase the complexity of my comparison. Before I just did linear versus radial, but I was using the default cost for each one. Now I'm gonna try changing the cost parameter on the error uh, as well and see its effect on the error rate. Okay, so I set up my cross validation list with all my folds inside, same as before. And I'm gonna test values of cost from one to 100. And I'll break my code up into two pieces. First, I'll look at the linear SVM with a variable cost. Okay, and uh, just let me show you this part. This is a copy and paste from before. Let 
from the previous example, which was probably 19.3, right? Yeah, so try to understand the code in 19.3 and then see the inside of that, of this one is that code. All I did was I now want to not just do cross validation, but I want to change the cost every time. So I want to iterate over cost. Cost goes from one to 100. I want to apply this function over that. This is a function of y, and then here's my other change. It's right here. So it'll do cross validation for one level of uh, one value of cost, and then repeat that, and then repeat that, and then repeat that over all the values of cost. So let's see what my uh, the object that's returned from this looks like. So we'll define cost. It's saved to an object called error linear. Okay, and it's actually gonna take a minute for this to run because now it has to fit, well, 100 values of cost, and then it's doing tenfold cross-validation for each. So it's fitting 100 different SVMs. Wait, no, I can't multiply. That's 1,000 SVMs, right? Yeah, uh, 100 looping over cost 100 times, looping over those validation training splits 10 times. Yeah, they had to fit 1,000 support vector machines. And so here, this is showing the error rate for the linear kernel for the different values of cost. And what do you notice? They're all the same. I think we actually saw that in support vector machines, right? We had, if we had a linear kernel on the iris data, if we change the cost, it just barely changed that line. It may not have even changed any classifications. It doesn't look like it's changing any classifications here. So that's um, maybe it wasn't necessary to do all that work, but it's, it's a little interesting. I repeat that for the radial SVMs. I wait a second for it to fit all 1,000. Okay, so let me look at that one. This is not constant. This is changing. It looks like the uh, decision boundary and the classifications and then the number of misclassifications is changing depending on the cost for the radial kernel. All right, well, uh, let, me, let me plot this. This is gonna be a lot more meaningful if I make a plot. Okay, so it's down here. Let me look at it on paper where it's a little bigger. All right, a couple things to say about this. Uh, first, first I should have, okay, I do have a legend. All right, yeah, linear down here. And that one's flat, that's not changing. Uh, the radial. And this is kind of wiggly. But we do see a general kind of shape to this. If I can smooth this out a little bit, see if you can remember some of these concepts from the first day of class. Why is my error rate a little bit high over here at the low cost? What, what kind of fitting is happening here, under or over? Say over. Try again, yeah. Yeah, uh, over here, if cost is low, this is giving you more rigid decision boundaries, which may not be flexible enough to fit to the data. So you're underfitting over here. Looks like the sweet spot is here at a value of cost around 15 to 20. And then as you get past that, this is going up because now it's getting too flexible and it's starting to fit the noise and individual observations. then you're starting to overfit with the radial kernel. And I thought this example would have been really interesting if, what if there were some values of cost where the radial kernel would actually perform better than the linear kernel? That's possible, but it didn't happen with this data set. From this one, it doesn't really matter what value of cost, you're probably better off sticking with a uh, linear kernel. Okay, anything else to say about that? I think that's the end of lecture 19. Questions on anything there?
Okay, let's just take a look at the homework. Three problems, two for undergrads, grad students will do all three. Um, these are problems intended for you to be able to copy a lot of the code that I've given, just edit it in certain places. I'd like you to mimic example 19.4, but instead of a support vector machine for classification, use k nearest neighbors for classification. Use tenfold cross validation, uh, produce a plot of misclassifications against K. So I'd like to see a plot. It's gonna be a lot like this one, um, except on the axis down here, you're gonna have K, the number of neighbors, and you're not gonna have two lines because there's not a choice like linear versus radial for this one. So one trend line, see what that looks like for different values of K. Uh, make a conclusion, report the value of K that you think is best. And as a reminder, the support vector machine scales the data automatically. The K nearest neighbors code does not. So you'll need to go back to your, I think homework 12 code, take the part that uh, scales the data and, and bring that into the solution as well. All right, for two, I want you to practice doing this with regression, not just classification. Um, predict price of a car from horsepower, weight, width, and length, tenfold cross validation. And one of the changes you'll have to make, a misclassification rate doesn't apply here. Instead, you'll need to calculate sum of squared error. So you'll need some thought on how do you edit a line like, a line like this. This gives you the number of misclassifications for regression or for classification, sorry. So think about how to edit for regression. And then finally, for the grad students, I want you to model example 19.4 so that the plot shows error on the training set instead of on the validation set. So it's the validation set that's the most important because that helps us understand how the model performs on data that it hasn't been trained on. If you were to evaluate the radial SVM on the same data, what do you think would happen? Do you think, would you still have the radial with higher error or would that be lower? I think it might be lower because, because of the overfitting, especially as this gets larger, um, it's going to do better and better on the same data it's been trained on because it's fitting the particular observations. So you'll, you should see this uh, pattern kind of switch where linear will be above. So that'll give you an idea of what to expect and help you know if the answer is right or not. 